Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, so last night I got sucked into a complete internet rabbit hole. I stepped really, really late. Uh, my hair was kind of a mess, which is why I am rocking my grandmother's uh, braids today. Uh, but anyway, I stayed up really late because I found this website called openlibrary.org and just for fun, I typed in knitting and I ended up finding like these old, old knitting books, like patterns um, from the 1800s. Some of the first ones that I found was from 1800 in, in German, um, the ladies knitting and netting book from 1840 all these years and they were absolutely fantastic so I got completely sidetracked with looking into the details of all of these patterns and I found this one book I just I knew I had a knit one it was published in 1885 originally and it's called fancy work recreations or recreations um, and it's by uh, Eva M Niles and I was flipping through this and I mean the cover is absolutely gorgeous as you can see and then when I turned the pages, what really drew me in in the beginning is the fact that there's this handwritten note that you can see here. And it turns out that this note was written by the author herself in 1887. So Eva wrote this to this person who owned this book, and it turns out that she um, gifted this book to this person. And she says it here. She said, I was inquisitive enough yesterday to ask your name because I liked your face. So she sent someone this book because they li she liked their face, which I just, I thought that was really, really funny. Um, now looking through some of the books that I had found previously, I found a lot of really interesting patterns. So some common themes that I found were like um, carriage mats and toilet cushions and things like that, things that I feel like I wouldn't even think about knitting today, but they were common knitting pa for patterns in the 1800s, which I found absolutely fascinating. One thing that I did find was kind of a common theme throughout those patterns is that gauge is never really discussed. And seeing as I have already, oh, sorry, my dog. And seeing that I already have a problem with getting my gauge right, I decided to find a pattern where maybe getting the exact gauge perfectly wouldn't be such an issue. Okay, so the pattern that I ended up choosing is this knitted slipper. And the reason I chose it was because a lot of the dis directions kind of say, you know, knit until it's the length of your foot or knit until it's the width of your foot. So I could, I was hoping, or I am hoping that when I knit this, that I would be able just to hold my work up to my foot and then that's the way that I know that I'm, I'm done and ready to go. I was kind of looking through this pattern to see what the construction might be like and it kind of seems a little mysterious to me. I think what I'm just gonna do is start knitting and see what I end up with and hope that it ends up looking kind of like the example that I have. Fingers crossed. <laughs> the first task at hand was to find the appropriate yarn for this project. The pattern called for a white and a blue wool yarn, and I was able to find this white one and this blue one from my admittedly quite disorganized stash. Since I believe these yarns were a gift from my mom, I don't 100% know where they're from, but the white yarn is 100% wool, and the blue yarn is, well, not 100%, but at least 50% lamb's wool. Since this project calls for three needles eventually, I went with three 3.75 millimeter double pointed needles. Now the first step of the pattern calls for you to cast on 10 stitches. It doesn't specify what kind of cast on to use, so I just decided to use the long tail cast on because I'm pretty comfortable with that one. And it didn't seem like this area needed a lot of stretch. From what I could tell, this is going to be the, at the toe of the slipper, so I thought that would be okay. Now, this next part you will see me struggling with quite a bit. I hope it doesn't frustrate anyone else as much as it did me, but I just could not get this technique worked out at first. You can see me really struggling with this. Okay, so I'll read the pattern to you guys so that you guys know exactly what my instructions were. So it says, when knitting every other row, pass the white wool between every stitch, leaving a loop of about an inch on one side and drawing it tight on the other side. So you can see here that after quite a bit of struggling, I got these loops finished on one side, and I think that they're supposed to act kind of like thrums, making the inside of the slipper nice and soft. It took me a while though to master a technique that went a little faster than my first row did. 
Now at this point you can see I worked a few more rows so every other row I'm putting these thrums and then in between where these white thrums are I'm actually increasing so you're getting kind of this um, widening shape to go across the top front of your toes. Now I still don't have a perfect technique down of getting these thrums in which you can see I'm, I'm still struggling with a little bit here um, but you can see kind of the plushness forming on the inside of the slipper here. Okay, so this next bit, I kind of want to talk about a misinterpretation of the pattern that I had. So it said, in knitting the next row, the white wool is not used, but is drawn straight across the work. So you can kind of see that when you're looking at the inside of the work, this is the outside, but when you're looking at the inside of the work, you get these like extra strings here. And I feel like, you know, I skipped ahead here a little bit in the video because I was just like, this is not how this is supposed to work at all. Um, if I try to put this on my foot, my toes would be constantly tangled in these extra loose strings. So what I decided to do is just cut them and then sew in the ends each individually. The rest of the video I'm actually going to be showing the second slipper that I made because I uh, rectified this mistake when I started knitting the second slipper. But yeah, lesson learned. This is not how you draw it straight across. So you can see the second slipper here, second time is a charm, so instead of just carrying the white yarn straight across, I treated it as if it were like color work floats, and I twisted the yarn in the back to kind of secure the white yarn in place. Um, you can see here I have a slightly uh, improved technique for doing the thrums with the white yarn on the inside, I'll show you some details of that later. Um, but now I'm at the point where I'm basically casting off the middle 10 stitches as the pattern calls for. So the top portion is wide enough for my foot, for my toe area, then you cast off the middle 10 and that leaves me with 12 stitches on both the right needle and the left needle. And I'm going to continue working on just one side, um, down the side of my foot basically. So here I wanted to show off my improved thrumming technique. So every other stitch you want to create this like white thrum with a yarn. So here you can see me pinching that white fabric between my finger and thumb and then holding against the work and then knitting. I only ever knit the blue yarn. So I knit and I skip every other one and then I pinch between my thumb and forefinger and I keep going all the way down the row like that. Every other one you pinch and you pull for about an inch long loop. Here I wanted to demonstrate a little bit more about how I am carrying the white yarn across when I am not working on the thrums because the thrums on the right of the work that white yarn is just carried straight across. So about every three to four stitches, depending on you know how many stitches I have, I'm twisting my work. And then you can see here that instead of it being this long loose line, it's actually kind of twisted in there and held securely against the work so my toes can't really get caught up in it. This last one is the technique of how I carry the uh, white yarn up between rows. It's kind of unfortunate that I figured this out like part way through my second um, slipper, but it makes for a nice cleaner finish. You can see how I kind of carried that up um, instead of over and around to the right, but up in between the two stitches. And then more examples of how I'm twisting the work in the back to carry that white yarn across um, rather than, you know, have it hanging loose and just making sure that the thrums aren't cut up by carrying that white yarn across on the um, right side rows where I'm not actually creating the thrums there. All right, so you just keep going in this pattern. On the wrong side of the fabric, you put the thrums every other stitch. On the right side, you carry the white yarn across, uh, making sure to twist it as if you're working on the floats of color work until that one side is the length of your foot. So you can see the bottom toe part and then the left side or right side of the slipper, depending. And then on the inside, you can see what the thrums look like. I think they look really nice, really nice and soft and fluffy, kind of like my dog who is resting against my side here. What I didn't expect from the thrumming technique is that the white yarn would poke through on the right side of the fabric to look a little bit like polka dots. I really like the effect. So a little more detail on how I carry the white yarn from the right side of the piece to the wrong side of the slipper. Um, so rather than wrapping it around to the right side of the work after knitting the first blue stitch, I 
moved it in between the first and second blue stitch and I feel that that makes for a much nicer um, like polka dotted effect that matches with the rest of the fabric as you can see um, carrying along down the side um, rather than the original method that I had used which looks a little unfortunate now because I switched a little bit late so you can see that at the tip of this slipper and I used it all along the second one but I think that the one that the method I just showed you is much cleaner okay so after picking up the second side of the slipper and you knit it to the same exact length of the first side you can see you've got this like U shape and I think I'm starting to see the slipper form and uh, you can see the toe up the front and then it says to stitch the heel stitches together in the back and then sew together on the sole what I didn't notice in the instructions is that material supposed to have is also two lambs wool soles, which I, of course, don't have on hand. So I guess something that I have to create myself and design myself is knit myself some soles for these slippers. However, first things first, I have to um, sew together the heels of these slippers. So I decided to use the Kitchener stitch. Looking back, I would probably not use that. It does say to cast off and then sew them together and I think that makes a lot more sense because this is kind of like a thin portion of the slipper because it doesn't have any thrumming and it added some extra length whereas I wish it would have been a little bit tighter around my heel rather than creating this extra length and width to the slipper that I have. Okay, so here I am starting with the sole design. I cast on 10 stitches and then I just kind of worked in the same, you know, thrum one um, knit with an increase on the other for three rows. And then I just started knitting straight. So you can see kind of this is how the sole is starting to form um, with the thrums on the inside, just like the sides and front part of the slipper. Here I am at the point where I'm almost done with the sole. I decided that after I got to about the point where the slipper itself started kind of coming into a V, I would start decreasing, but not every other, but every third. And then I cast off once I got to about um, 10 stitches left on my needle so that when I sewed everything on, it would match up with the slipper top portion and side portion that I already had. And here you can see me matching my self-designed sole up to the pattern recommended um, tops and sides. Then I just sewed them together with a really simple, I guess you would call it whip stitch. I kind of measured out how much yarn I would need by going around three times. I think that's a little excessive, um, but I never want to run out of yarn when I'm sewing something together and I wasn't really low on supply, so I felt okay doing that. After sewing in all the ends, I decided to do that first before sewing the two pieces together. Um, I wasn't particularly careful about sewing in the ends because I knew that all the end up ending pieces would just be on the inside of a very plush slipper already, so I just kind of, you know, did it to the best of my ability and then started actually sewing the bottom sole to the top and sides. What helps me a lot in sewing these pieces together is kind of pinning them together. Uh, for my pins, I use the other knitting needles that I had because um, that's what I had on hand and I was a bit lazy to get up at this time of night um, but it worked and then I just mashed it up as best as I could and I just used the tapestry needle and uh, whip stitched the pieces together. And there you have the knit portion of the slipper. All the pieces are sewn together and I really love how plush the inside has turned out. It's really, really soft and cozy. I can't wait to actually put these on. But before I could say that this design was exactly complete, I wanted to replicate what the pattern said exactly. So I took this cream colored ribbon that I had and I decided to sew it on as best as I could replicate from what the picture was in the pattern book. Disclaimer, I am not a sewer whatsoever, so I did my absolute best. You could see that I struggled quite a bit with these box pleats, trying to get them lined up and even and using the pins and stabbing myself quite a few times. I'd say there's a few close calls, like right here. Oh god, this is really hard to watch, actually. Whew, of getting the uh, pleats actually lined up and somewhat even and then sewn on securely to the rest of the slipper. 
The second problem that I had is that the thread that I ended up picking out was not exactly the same uh, color family as the cream ribbon. I think it's actually like an icy blue. Uh, that's my fault and I honestly was a little too impatient to go back and fix it. Um, but the stitches are so small and the ruffles are kind of pulled so nice and tight that it's actually hard to tell in the final piece and it doesn't bother me too much. In any case, I spent a lot of time um, sewing these ruffles onto the edge of my slipper and then kind of pulling taut and ruffling up the ribbon as best as I could to kind of mimic what it looked like on the page that I saw. The other, let's not call it trick, that I used is I didn't actually have a pin cushion, so I ended up using a wrinkle in my jeans on my leg to hold my pins and uh, not gonna lie, I stabbed myself in the leg a few times, so maybe that wasn't the smartest choice. Maybe I should use a, get a pin cushion in the future if I plan on doing any more sewing. On a slightly unrelated note, I am doubly proud of this sewing work because not only do I never really sew, but also in order to get this, you know, first person point of view of footage of me sewing, I actually uh, like clamped the tripod for the camera around my neck so that I couldn't see what I was doing. So I'm kind of doing this completely blind except for a blurry picture that I can see about an inch from my face in the camera screen of the tripod that's clamped around my neck. Anyway, the last step is uh, recreating this bow that I saw on the front. Here I am just trying to figure out if the size is right and maybe how I can pleat the ribbon together to make it look somewhat similar. I decided to sew the ribbon itself, or sorry, the bow itself separately first, and then after I get all the folds and sizes correct, I uh, decided to secure it finally to the slipper itself. Alright, after attaching the bow, this is the completed slipper. My dog Nutella modeled it for me first. I think she looks absolutely fantastic in them. But overall, I'm incredibly pleased with how it turned out, especially considering that the pattern is slightly vague, I didn't actually have the materials I needed, and I am not an expert sewer, much less uh, trying to sew some trim and bows with ribbon. Overall, it was such a fun experience, knitting from an 18 85 pattern for house slippers. I see lots of room for improvement, but I think it was a really good experience and I'm definitely going to be wearing these. These are super comfortable. Um, if you guys like watching this video, go ahead and give it a like, put a comment below on what you think. Um, feel free to subscribe because I'll be doing more of these in the future and thank you so much for watching.